Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This beautiful, beautiful Thursday morning. Sun is up here in Washington, D.C. And we're going to talk about food for change today. And we have online with us this morning, Mr. Steve Alves. Good morning, Steve. Hi, Vernon. How are you doing this morning? I am great. Good, 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 good. You know, I thought one went to school to learn how to produce movies and films to make a lot of money. (laughs) <laughs> Why are you doing what you do? Because I don't think you make a lot of money producing videos on food for change or documentaries yeah. on food for yeah. change and cooperatives. Yeah, you know, uh, I spoke to a, a very high-level uh, person who advises people on filmmaking and particularly in the area of promotion, and he sort of diagnosed people like me. He says, people like you that are independent producers, they do it because they can't not do it. Hmm. <laughs> it's like I was cast this way, and I went through a lot of other experiences. You know, I was in Hollywood. I was in the trenches in Hollywood making these B-movies, stupid chase movies, very derivative, nothing particularly original about it. I could see my future in that world, and it just didn't feel right. And I got out of L.A., and I went to New York, and I did commercials and trailers and all other things. And then when I hit the documentary world, you know, all of a sudden, uh, the world was uh, went from black and white to technicolor. I was involved in issues. I had people that were real and family stories and historical stories, socially important, environmental things. And then, you know, every time I made a film, uh, I, I mastered and learned another subject matter. So I, I've just grown tremendously as a person. Uh, and it's true, uh, you know, I've not my bank account has not grown, grown tremendously. But uh, as far as the rewards go, I am very happy with the decisions I have made. So what are the issues? What are the issues in Food for Change? Uh, I think there are the issues that are the core of our society that have to do at the very base with uh, economic fairness and opportunity and participation in your community. Uh, And the cooperative movement, uh, which is this beautiful flickering flame that has never really grabbed on entirely to the degree that I think cooperatives would like to see it. They they consider it one of the best kept secrets in America, but it nevertheless exists and has a a pretty significant impact in the areas where it does operate. Um, So when you get that and you use the cooperative movement and cooperative principles as a protagonist in American historical story, it gives you the opportunity to discuss many other things. And the other thing that I get into in this film is that tension between power for the people and power for the few, power for the corporations, the tendency towards consolidation of wealth, monopoly power, which is a word that we don't think about as much anymore or talk about, but it is the logical follow-up to a lot of the discussions that have been going on today. I like this beautiful flickering flame. (laughs) <laughs> I like that. We, yeah, you can use that whenever you want. Now. Thank you, thank you. Because we get several descriptives of of co-ops. Uh, co-ops are people helping people. Uh, Chuck Snyder said that early on. I think that first October, uh, he's the president of NCB. Uh, I'm, aware, I'm aware of that. He was yeah. he helped my film. They were a contributor to making my film. So I'd like to acknowledge that. Okay, fantastic. And they they are, matter of fact, somebody uh, on the program from Cabot Creamery, Cabot Cheese, said that Chuck Snyder is an angel for all that he does and helping to put money in things like this. And this co-op, uh, the bank is a cooperative, and it's cooperate, cooperatives helping cooperatives, the sixth principle. Um, but another uh, descriptive I found for co-ops that I like is um, at Greenbelt Homes, and, and there, there was a plaque on the wall that said, 
cooperatives give people the tools to control their destiny. And, and you talked about that power for the people and as opposed to power for the few. So uh, I like these descriptions, but I like yours. I'm going to put that one up. A beautiful flickering flame that most people don't even know about. It flickers only because people don't know about it, and it comes in and does well, and then it dies out, and it does well and dies out. And I have asked a question on this program over the last three years, is why is it that more people don't know about co-ops? Why is it that the flame doesn't just catch on and grow? Um, because it has such great, great potential for the people. Yeah. Well, that's the reason I made the film, really, at the core of it. Because I was, a, I am a member of a food co-op. I'm also a member of a credit union. I've been a member of my co-op, food co-op, for uh, you know 23 years, I think, at this point. Uh, when I joined, uh, I, I shopped there before, and, and I realized how much value I was getting, you know, myself from being a part of it. But I also saw the tremendous value that it was giving to my community. It moved into an abandoned building. Uh, J.C. Penney had uh, de- deserted Main Street, like like a lot of the other big chains had. And uh, you know, these co- co-operators went in there and re- revamped the store, raised a lot of money, and opened it. And it was a beautiful thing. It just added so much value to my life. So that was kind of the the wake-up call. But then when I was asked to make a movie, which was originally planned as a small movie, and I did the research, I realized this is a great story, and it's really particularly a great American story. We don't think of co-ops as particularly, uh, you know, American because the real successes, bigger successes happened in Europe, particularly in Spain, Italy, England. But we have had our own cooperative movement here particularly in the farm sector. Uh, And uh, when I learned it and read about it, and then I became an informed member of a co-op, and I felt like, well, uh, I felt the ability and the sort of, uh, you know, responsibility, not terribly guilt-ridden responsibility, but like a positive responsibility that I was in a position as a a, um, skilled filmmaker to tell a story that at the end of it, people would go, ah, oh, so that's what a co-op is. I get it. I, and they've been part of society for this long. And they're kind of consistently fighting uh, or engaged in in a struggle uh, against an entity that is trying to make us less citizens, less informed, less participants in, uh, in the destiny of our own lives, like that quote you were saying. Mm-hmm. And in, if you see the film, uh, you know, most people, the, the main reaction I get is they just feel inspired after it's over. It's pretty hard to put in words if you're just talking to, say, a stranger and you say you work for such and so a co-op. And then they say, well, what's a co-op? You know, and then you say, well, it's people getting together to start a, a business mostly to fulfill a certain need in their lives. And then you can cite this and this and this. But you don't get any kind of emotional connection usually when you explain that to somebody. And it still seems abstract, and it is abstract because they haven't seen it in action. Mm -hmm. In a motion picture and a documentary, you can show it in action. You can show people, like one of the the sections of the film, shows a young woman in college, light goes off in her head, she wants to create a co-op in her community in Keene, New Hampshire. As a young woman, she's probably mid-20s when she starts this, and she just goes about all the steps of doing it, and then you see this 10,000-square-foot store uh, open at the, <laughs> in the film, and you see in the, the, the gathering, the meetings, and the first annual meeting, and you just get a feel for that sort of human endeavor, which, you know, as she says, it just brings a lot of joy to people's lives when they engage in, on that level. You know, I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, and that is that <clears throat> co-ops have been around for so long. But how long is long? And and it is the NCBA, NC National Cooperative Business Association. They're celebrating their hundredth year now. This is where it's a it's sort of a, a umbrella group for all of the co-op housing co-ops, credit unions, um, all of the farm co-ops that you talked about, they all come together so that they'll have an organization to talk about the needs, particularly legal issues, well, all all of the needs for for co-ops in in society and also to try to spread the word out about what what co-ops are. But they've been around for 100 years. Oh, yeah, in this country, yeah, Cooperative League is 100 years old. 
You can even go back further than that, and you saw some of the worker co-ops attempts of the Knights of Labor back in the 1870s or some came out of the Grange movement. Um, so, but, you know, by the time, and you had a lot of ethnic co-ops, you know, uh, the, the Finnish co-ops, Scandinavian co-ops, they brought a lot of those principles here, Polish co-ops. Um, uh, and then it became more sort of um, assimilated into an American social movement, you know, right around the time that the Cooperative League was formed. And then they started doing their newsletters and informing people and organizing and trying to get disparate groups to come under their umbrella organization. I'm sure you know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty exciting and hopeful time uh, to go back to uh, 1916 and think of, you know, what people were trying to start then. Also, it's interesting that there was so much going on in the African-American community, which people don't know about, I didn't know about. And matter of fact, uh, Jessica Gordon Nimhard, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard wrote a book called Collective Carriage, and she's been on the show a couple of times. And she said when she started her research, people told her that there isn't any history in African-Americans and co-ops. And she's just found a wealth of knowledge uh, about uh, African-Americans uh, during the Great Depression, during the Civil yeah. Rights Movement, all the way through, uh, and a lot led by women uh, coming together collectively to solve. This is the other uh, way I've found that co-ops are described is co-ops are formed to solve community problems, and African Americans have had a lot of community problems and still do in yeah. America. So yeah. coming together, well, forming businesses, creating yeah, social uh, and, and financial wealth. Uh, I'm quite aware of her book. I read it as soon as it came out, and I met her personally, and I was at the uh, NCBA award ceremony when she was given the uh, uh, Cooperative Hero Award. Uh, she's a, a brilliant woman. Uh, she has uh, uh, uncovered a lot of what would have been forgotten history, mm -hmm. something that I've also tried to do in my film, because if there aren't people like uh, Jessica, Professor Nemhard out there, this stuff can end up never being known to the public. And particularly what she reveals in that book, which is, you know, a lot of times in the, in the black communities, they didn't want to have a high profile because there were so many uh, uh, people that are, had animosity towards letting them have fair opportunities for education, for work, for many sectors that they didn't want to get too ruffle too many feathers, so they stuck to their own communities and became some of the strongest communities of all. Uh, a lot of history of uh, black communities led some of the most powerful boycotts that the nation have, has ever had, uh, so they know how to organize. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem that co-ops have in uh, more low-income com areas is just getting access to capital. Uh, but when they do that, and there's the Renaissance co-op that just formed in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, which is um, poised to do really great things in, in its community. And, and the other thing is that success should not be weighed simply by, you know, is it profit-making? Is it, you know, what's it doing in terms of business terms? Uh, that's not always the, the great marker, although we will definitely want to see that, Um the other marker is when you become involved in a co-op and you participate in it, you meet all kinds of other people, and you are really part of, of being part of a, a group and a community. And having to do that, I mean, doing that and wanting to do it and wanting to do it right, you have to grow as an individual to be part of that. You have to be a fair and thoughtful person. You can't be willful. You can't be uh, just uh, solely individualistic. You have to think in terms of the whole entity of people that that uh, the, your co-op is serving. Well, the other the other part of that is um, what you just talked about. Or at least what it hit to me is the fifth principle of cooperatives, and that is education, training, and information. When you get in a co-op, that is a, a big piece of the fabric is getting people to where they are knowledgeable, which means you learn how to work together, you learn yeah. how to solve problems together, you learn how to create plans and budgets and and move the organization along together. And when you have 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 people working together, it's so much better than one person starting a company. And that's why a lot of co-ops don't fail, 
But yeah. e- even if they did fail, one of the things that Dr. Nimhard said on the program is that all of these skills that people have learned, they still have. And that's one of the successes yeah. I think you were talking about. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, you know, she ends her book on that note, which I thought was a really beautiful way to end the book. That, you, you know, these people go off into their lives and their communities and they do all kinds of wonderful things because they got these skills, these civic skills, these skills to organize and work with other people and keep their eyes on the prize and not get lost in, you know, petty little squabbles that can come, you know, come up in any kind of human organization. Well, when two or more are gathered together, it says there's God also. And I've found on this program that God needs to be there when there's two or more because there's going to be conflict. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Conflict's not a bad thing. No, a no. lot of good things can come out of conflict and disagreement. If you learn how to how to approach yeah. it that way. And that's what you do with, with within co-ops in this uh, education, training, and information. Yeah, well, this does get back to your other point, uh, Vernon. Why d- does not does the public not that well informed about what cooperatives are? And uh, I think that Principle 5 is uh, the neglecting of Principle 5. William Nelson is a f- former uh, a per, a head of the uh, CHS Foundation and also uh, a, a real cooperative leader, cooperative hero. When he received his uh, award from the NCBA, I think it was two years ago, he really made the point that co-op people ignore education at their own peril. And I've heard many other co-op leaders say this. Uh, these are like some of the highest leaders ever. If they don't do education they're going to lose their membership, and they're not going to be able to spread the word on why cooperatives are a superior economic social model. But the education, talking about Jessica gordon Nimhart again, is that she had said that when, when these co-ops got into trouble, the African-American co-ops, they would come back to their study groups, mm-hmm. and that would help them get out of trouble. So it's consistently and continually studying. Uh, mm mm-hmm. And I have decided that uh, if I die with studying in a class or a book in my hand, I'll, I'll be very, very happy because I'll keep doing that <laughs> <laughs> until the last day. You'd be like Einstein. He's like working on his formula, and, you know, <laughs> he ran out of gas and he collapsed. And was it. <laughs> he was still trying to figure out the unified theory. Well, Nobody's figured it out yet. <laughs> speaking of education, uh, uh, Ralph Nader has asked David Thompson, who is in your in your video, to um, present at a co-op workshop at a national conference here in D.C. on September 26, 27, 28, and 29th mm-hmm. at Carnegie Center and Constitution Hall. And um, on the 28th, David is going to speak on uh, the 28th of September at 10.20 a.m., uh, he'll talk about the daily and local impact and ongoing national collaboration of 150 food co-ops that operate 220 stores across America. Those mm-hmm. 150 food co-ops do nearly $2 billion of business annually. So I would like to encourage you all to come out and listen to David. David has become a great friend of mine. He's an awesome friend of the cooperative movement. Um, he's been on the show a couple of times. Uh, he got the Voorhees Award uh, when I was the president mm-hmm. of the National Association of Housing Co-ops. He's just a wonderful human being. So, uh, yeah, David is a, is a friend of mine, too, and uh, I stay in touch with him. And uh, Well, you know, I um, he when I decided I was going to make the film, I did my research, and right away, you cannot avoid David Thompson if you're going to do any uh, thoughtful research into the cooperative movement uh, in the United States and England. So uh, I read all his books, and I articles and things he read uh, well in advance of um, uh, getting in touch with him and then eventually doing an interview with him. Uh, we spend the entire afternoon, I ended up with two hours of of material on David, uh, and he became the anchor interview in the film, and uh, I think he does a great job of filling in the story, you know, that I tell um, from the Great Depression uh, through to the present. And David is kind of the person I go back to for commentary through the film. Yeah, David is the one that talked to me first about the African Americans, blacks in in the U.S. and the correlation between blacks and the civil rights movement. I mean, cooperatives and the civil rights movement, uh, and that's just a, a almost like a one to one relationship. 
of of sort of like if there may not have been a civil rights movement if it wasn't for cooperative um or I said another way, if it wasn't for a cooperative, the civil rights movement would have probably looked a lot different. Even Rosa Parks had mm-hmm. been in training about the civil order and what are the rights and responsibilities of, of an American citizen. Um, which yeah. Was, the, um, in my film, I was able to connect a lot of those um, uh, uh, dots. Um and uh, I can show the connection between civil rights movement, war on poverty, and the current food co-ops that exist, because a lot of them uh, were seeded by um, funds from poverty programs, particularly the, my co-op was. Uh, and, um, you know, the person who was the original manager of my co-op was um, – got an 18-month jail sentence for trespassing in, uh, in a Georgia restaurant uh, in, uh, I think it was 1963. Uh, so he was really, you know, de- down there. He, wanted, he was from Chicago, middle-class kid, and he just saw the feeling of injustice. And like a, man, a lot of men, many uh, young people in that era, he felt like he wanted to do something about it. It was wrong, and he wanted to, to write it. So, and he became the one who um, started uh, my co-op. And so I was able to tell his story in my film and also, um, uh, you know, a co-op that got started in low income areas in Newark and, and in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, you can see this, this real footage, I mean, from that period, uh, which was really fun to uncover and I think really um, makes the film seem very um, alive. Speaking of Newark, um, there's a housing co-op in Newark, a couple hundred, no, 400 units. Um, they uh, paid off their mortgage, and they asked me to come up at the, for, for their 40th anniversary celebration. I spoke there. Uh, and it was a lot of fun meeting um, those folks that's run by and occupied by black people in Newark. And you don't hear these good stories. You hear all of the the bad stuff that happened yeah. in Newark and yeah, how many Charlotte units? and wherever yeah. else. Um, but you don't hear these good stories. How many units did they have there? It was 400. Wow. It was in a beautiful, beautiful landscape, uh, mm-hmm. gated community. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it was a very, very nice co-op. And I wish yeah, I could. you know, you, there's other thing is there's, you can only do so much research. It's just so hard. You'd have to become a professional detective. But you never know. Some of the people that were involved in that co-op that organized for that, you know, that co the food co-op that's in my film in Newark isn't doesn't exist anymore. I couldn't find it anywhere. But you could see that the people who were participating in those meetings that you can see in the film were standing up and talking to each other and saying how they're going to make things different, how they're going to procure their own food, and they're going to sell it, and they're going to try and uh, do better than the price that they were getting from their local grocer. And you could see that they were taking control of their lives and their situations. They might have gone out to do some of the uh, things like you're suggesting, you know, the same time period, the housing co-op, yeah, same could, area. Could have been the same same people. Yeah. So once, just real quickly out there, a, a co-op is any business you can think of. I see it as any business you can think of could be a co-op. If it's owned and operated by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. If it's owned and operated by the people that uses the products or services, it's called a consumer cooperative. Uh, worker cooperative, any business, just if the mm-hmm. workers own it. A lot of manufacturing businesses are going that way. Now, if you look at uh, consumer businesses, we've talked about credit unions and food Mm -hmm. co-ops, housing co-ops. The the people that own and control the business, they're the ones that use those services. And there's a – in Madison, Wisconsin, there is a uh, clinic, a health clinic that's owned by the patients. It's a Mm patient-centric clinic. So the policies and procedures are created by the patients for the patients, mm. the people. Yeah, there's also uh, purchasing cooperatives, which are, are big things, uh, like True Value is essentially a purchasing cooperative. It's a um, hardware store. Uh, in uh, your area, there's going to be a screening of Food for Change. And October 31st, part of uh, about 40 screenings that are going to happen across the country, and a gentleman who's been on your program a number of times, Paul Hazen, 
uh, who was the president and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association for several years. He is going to be at that screening, and he is forming and has organized a community purchasing alliance cooperative, which I find very exciting. It's for faith-based groups and unions, nonprofits, charter schools, enables them to pool their money together to get better deals from suppliers. And I consider uh, Paul a, a leading co- cooperator, and he's going to be at that screening. And uh, I'm hope I've asked him to be the honored guest, and uh, that he could also uh, say something about the work that he is doing for the Community Purchasing Alliance Cooperative. You know, um, Oaks Management. I have a property management business. We bought our. We became a member of. Uh, CPA, Community Purchasing Alliance, and we bought our um, uh, copy machine through them. And some people have have gotten solar panels, um, their trash. There's a lot of different things in this purchasing, and we'll come back and talk about that because we've got to take our first break. But I want to come back and talk about a little bit more about purchasing and marketing co-ops, which are other two biggest co-ops besides uh, employees, worker co-ops, and consumer co-ops. But we'll be right back, Steve, to talk more about the screenings throughout the U.S. and um, about your film. Okay, Please Brian. don't touch it down. We'll be right back, everybody. Fourteen fifty W O L. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, uh, Everything Co-op. You can go on, on our webpage, which is, which is everything.coop, everything.coop, and you can, get, you can sign up to get press releases of who's going to be on the show the following Thursday, and you can listen to previous shows. So this show will be on in about a week and will be loaded up, and you can uh, re-listen to it. Uh, and Steve Alves is our guest who has created a documentary, Food for Change. Uh, and Steve, you had mentioned that there's going to be a showing October 31st, and that's going to be at Bus Boys and Poets on 5th and K Streets. Um, that's Northwest. 5th and yep. K Street, Northwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's seating for, I think it's right around 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm wondering if it's going to be too small of a venue because there's, there's a lot of interest in your in co-ops in DC and in um, in your movie. So I'm, I they hope can always have be. another show. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was yeah. thinking about that on the way here. Yeah. Um, um, Pat Thornton, who's the producer of this show, has uh, put put together that timing and. Everything Co-op is helping to, to put that on and helping to fund it. So uh, we really are – we've seen it. We love it. We're thinking to just help everybody if you can come out to that showing on October 31st. Now, where are some of the other places? You're using October as – which because that's Co-op Month yeah. to have showings throughout the U.S. So where are some of the other places that you're having these? Uh, well, since I was on your – uh, program um, early June, we've been working tires, tirelessly to set up uh, screenings all over the country. And, you know, we've got them in Colorado and California, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maine. It's going to be shown on public TV in Maine in October, two screenings. Uh, and it's going to be shown in Philadelphia, nice large screening there. Northampton, Massachusetts, we've got a beautiful theater. We're going to have music before the show. Michigan, Wisconsin, altogether there are about 21 states uh, that are showing, uh, the film is being shown in, and that's representing about 40 different sponsored screenings. So I was uh, thinking, like you said, music before, what kind of programmatic kinds of things would make sense before and or after the show? Because uh, how long is the movie? 82 minutes. 82 minutes, so an yeah. hour and 22 minutes, hour and a half, say. Yeah, yeah, okay. and it's a new version of the film that I just put out. Uh, it has updated uh, narration and facts. It also has a Spanish translation version available that you can watch. It's closed captioned, 
Um, and um, I just looked at the proof last night, okay. <laughs> and it's looking good. So what I thought about is something before the show to maybe describe it and then something after it in a sense of a conversation or answer questions of people. Are there, are there for these screenings, is that happening? And is there, is there some kind of a yeah. program around this? I, I, you know, there's only one show that I am sort of in charge of the actual elements of the program. And that is in my area in Western Massachusetts in Northampton. But for the most part, the co-ops are organizing these shows. We are giving them lots of material, like a new trailer, a new press release, uh, photographs uh, to use. And uh, we've got about 40 different posts lined up to start sending out through social media that are going to happen soon. Uh, So, like, we are helping them have successful screenings. And in terms of the program, the one thing I think to keep in mind is that you're going to have your highest level of energy uh, at the end of the film. That's when you look at an audience and you see all these smiling faces. You know, I've been to a lot of audiences and they're, they feel good after the film is over. And, and, uh, and, and that is a type of positive energy that if you know how to focus it and capture it, you can do a lot of good for your co-op or whatever, you know, you're trying to advance here. So like some co-ops maybe are a startup and they want to sign up new members or they want to raise capital. So that's the time to make their pitch. Um, Other co-ops may be struggling because competition has gotten fierce in the natural foods area and they are, uh, uh, you know, against the ropes. So they're using it as a way to say, look what we have done uh, in America. Look what we've brought to American society, organic and natural food. Nobody wanted to go down that route back in the 70s. We hung in there because we thought it was important to have food that didn't have pesticides on it. And we've always taken a strong, strong stand for that. Now we are out front on local and regional food systems. Uh, you know, if, if you want to go shop at the other natural food store and think everything's equal, well, this film is telling you that there's, there is a, a different trajectory that food co-ops are on. So those co-ops are using it to define, define themselves in the marketplace. So it really depends, you know, what you want to do. You will have, you will be there. Paul Hazen will be there. Um, I think it probably, you know, to, to sort of solidify the impression that the film makes might be a good thing to do to get those people to do something. Because, you know, people want to react when they feel they've been moved in a certain way. And you may get some faith-based groups or nonprofits there that can be part of the Community Purchasing Alliance that didn't know about it before. Um, You know, there's, there's a whole array of ways that people uh, can use the film and you know i encourage it at a certain point it's um it's out of my hands and that's good i want the film to have its own life i want the people who feel it you know who see it and and uh like it to feel it's their their movie you know uh, that like uh, like you have a song sometimes that it's like your yes. song or your your romantic connection with your you know your your person in your life uh the i want the film to be part of helping to create a cooperative identity so that people that are working in co-ops now that don't know much about the past get us feeling like they're part of something that's really uh, been special and important in in our society and that that having that identity i'm hoping is a kind of a motivating and powerful force within them because work is work you still gotta show up and do it follow the rules but feel like they're on a side of working for something that has to do with social justice. Why do you think people feel good after the film, that energy level is high and positive? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing because I have a lot of uh, uh, negative things in the film. You know, there's a lot of things that don't go well uh, in the in the history in our history. There's the Great Depression. There's a lot of suffering that goes on in different parts of our society and wars that we've engaged in and uh, 
witch hunts for communists and you you know you name it all this uh, negative thing but i did not want to make a film that made you feel bad at the end and as you sort of move through time you see the co-ops are always doing uh, a good and positive thing in, in society they're trying to move us forward um and then when you get to the present day, I'd say the last maybe 25 minutes of the film is contemporary. You go to the Twin Cities area. You go to um, schools where the, the co-ops in the area have funded these programs to teach kids about good eating, growing your own food, you know, what nutrition is. You see these lovely children in their schools going about it. You know, when you talk to um, children that are in the fourth grade, pretty much anything they say is going to be amusing. You know, mm-hmm. it's like that was that Art Link letter show of years ago, if you may remember. You know, they're just they're cute and they're funny and they they say the most things you don't expect. So you you get a, you find amusement in that. You see that the power of uh, co-ops working together can do in the Twin Cities area. You see a startup co-op. Um, you see this effect of one co-op that goes from eight million a year in sales to twenty-seven million in sales in a matter of eight years, and they're they're helping four hundred local farmers and other vendors, and they're sending back five point four million dollars to their region, uh, and, you know, just in terms of supplier sales. Um, you get to see that something really powerful is underfoot. And I think that people that are active in this area know that that is happening. Co-ops are one part of it, but there's a lot of stuff underfoot that is happening right now that people aren't talking about that much that is the quiet revolution that co-ops always thought they were part of that is really is, is transforming our society right now. And you can't really see it, but when you get down in it, you know it's a significant thing that's happening. And when the film ends, you get that. Well, one of the reasons National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program and why we have it is to to get this message out, the same reason that you did the film, is to tell people about the positiveness that's underneath that's going on and most people don't know about it. You mentioned it's the best kept secret. I said I think one of the things, other problems with co-ops besides not continually educating is that they don't shout from the roof the good stuff that they do. <laughs> sort of like we just do it and maybe people will learn about it. Um, yeah. So Yeah, and I understand that impulse too, you know. Um, you like to sort of go about your work. In a lot of ways I feel a natural inclination towards being an introvert. But on the other hand, if I know something and I don't decide not to be out front with my knowledge of it and it has the stands to, to benefit other people, that, um, you know, I'm kind of derelict in my what I, my, what I think of as my responsibility is as just a citizen and a human being to try to uh, talk about things that are good and, and positive and that move us you know, uh, and the arc that leads to better lives for for more people and fairness across the board. Better lives, fairness, having a sense of, and this is a question I've asked for the three years is, do you like what you're doing? I already know you do. You've already explained that. But everybody that comes on this program loves what they do because they're helping other people. And one of the things about the the values of co-ops, they talk about ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. And mm-hmm. when you're doing those things, it seems like you, you, you see your worth or your purpose uh, in life. And so you really enjoy what you're doing. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was at a conference recently, and there was a woman there. This was all about uh, food issues, uh, uh, people that um, don't get enough to, enough to eat, you know. Uh, and, um, you know, I could see that they were there working with each other to try to feel, to find resources to address this urgent need in our society, which is a major topic for Congressman uh, Jim McGovern, who's my local representative, who we expect, uh, uh, he's planned to attend the screening that we're going to have on uh, October 27th in, in Northampton. Massachusetts. And 
uh, you know, one of the things I think you when you when you're down in the dumps, and we all get there at certain parts of our lives. I've always found one of the best things that I can do is do something for somebody else. Yes. Yes. Think of somebody else. Try to be a helper. You know, don't just wallow in it, but uh, you know, be kind. And and then that is what I think brings you out of those slumps that you know, we're all going to get into. Um, and um, you know, that's my prescription, doctor. Okay. <laughs> But you love what you're doing because you're helping others. And then if you find you in a dump, just go help somebody. Listen, if you have a question of Steve or myself or a comment, you can call in at 1-800-450-7876, 1-800-450-7876. And we're going to take our final break, Steve. We only have 15 more minutes, and then we'll come back and talk more about the documentary Food for Change. Okay. And how that helps people and how the co-ops have helped people throughout. I want to say throughout time. We only talk about since 1844. But that's what folks in Africa lived in tribes and everybody knew what they had to do. We'll be right back, everybody. Fourteen fifty W O L. Information is power. Well, the power comes from using the information. Uh, National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program. National Co-op Bank customers are cooperatives, such as grocery, wholesale co-ops, purchasing co-ops, or housing co-ops. Other customers share in the spirit of cooperation driven by democratic organizing principles. They may be Alaskan and Native American enterprises, which by their very nature are member-run and member-owned. Others may be community health centers or charter schools driven entirely by community needs. What they all have in common is a single fundamental principle. They have joined together cooperatively to meet personal, social, and or business needs. So we were talking about that earlier that my view of it, Steve, is that when you go back far enough, you find that people live in groups or tribes or perhaps in caves, and everybody had to work together. I <laughs> mean. Everybody oh, yeah. had yeah. had to have what they did for the group, it's sort of like this individual thing, uh, this this sort of um, John Wayne or what's that man's name? Uh, Trump. Um, yeah. That, that I did it by myself. That just doesn't yeah. really it never happen first. But um, there's always some other groups. But mainly when you have people working together cooperatively to make decisions that are best for the group, not necessarily what's best for an individual or their friends or family members, but yeah. what's best for the collective. Yeah, that's why yeah. I like co-ops too. Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of the stories that America has told itself have to do with kind of the – the uh, you know hyper individualism you know the, the man against everything and I think that's not a very productive story nor is it a correct one. I think the more accurate story of uh, humanity through the ages is uh, is cooperation, and we are programmed to cooperate. Or it's encoded in our genes. Uh, you know we developed a lot of ways that we we learn how to cooperate. We have these educational institutions, we have language. If you look at the, the formative years of our species, we had to cooperate in order to survive. Uh, we were small bands of people living 30, 50, eventually a couple of hundred. But, uh, you know, that was the story of humanity for, you know, a hundred and, uh, say, a hundred and fifty or more years. Uh, 150,000. Okay. 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 <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then we did spread, and then we eventually we built larger larger civilizations and larger societies, made things more complicated. But uh, always, uh, you know, that impulse to cooperate and to cooperate as a free individual. It doesn't mean it's an individualistic idea. It means it's voluntary cooperation. Uh, you're not coercively forced to cooperate. You're not conscripted to be a cooperator. You're a cooperator because it is in your interest and the, in the interest of your family and your community and society in general to think in terms of 
how to harmoniously uh, make things better uh, and not be willful and destructive. So how do you think we can get cooperators and cooperatives in this dialogue between Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump? How, how can we get... Uh, well, I don't think Trump wants to be president. He wants to be king. <laughs> okay. okay. So, you know, I don't really see much hope in that regard. Uh, that man, he doesn't have the spirit of cooperation in him. And at least to say there's no evidence to suggest that, okay? Uh, if you're a public servant, yeah, you know, it's pretty tough and you get beat up and, you know, people attack you because... Maybe they don't like the way direction you want things to go. But by virtue of being a public servant, true public servant, you have to learn to cooperate. Uh, government is an exercise in cooperation as well when it's done right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I would have to uh, put my uh, vote in that case for what I hope will be the first female elected president of the United States, Hillary Clinton. And I think she she understands cooperation, and I think she'll advance the cause. I mean, I, it's we are now um, if getting very close to National Co-op Month. Uh, National Co-op Month was started. Um, well, the, the first Secretary of Agriculture was appointed by the Kennedy by John F. Kennedy during those idealistic years of the Kennedy administration. Uh, and co-ops always have had an idealistic streak in them. Called, they, they call themselves practical idealists. Now, that same secretary um, was, uh, was the one who created National Co-op Month in 1964. And uh, so I think um, that, that, that is more the roots that we're talking about. We're talking about cooperatives, mm -hmm. and that's where they were, they were formed, and that's – if you look at the quotes from um, Orville, uh, he was former governor governor of Minnesota, um, and I can't remember his last name right now, but he was the one who put forward this idea, let's have a national month of cooperatives. And um, um, so that's what we'll be celebrating soon. It's, it's a good idea in a, another way because co-ops need as many things – in their favor as they can to help get the word out about who they are and what they're what they're about. And uh, I think that when you um, when you have something like a co-op month and when I can have a screening where there's 40 screenings across the country during that amount of time, uh, you get to sort of turn up the volume on what a co-op is, and you at least get people curious to wonder, you know, everybody likes the word cooperation, but they don't know that there's a, an actual codified set of principles that have to do with implementing cooperation in social social systems. What? And uh, it was uh, Orville Freeman. Okay. He was Secretary of Agriculture. And he was the one appointed by Kennedy, and under the Johnson administration, he created National Co-op Month. So... Uh, I see it as an opportunity to spread the word on cooperatives. And the film I made is just meant to be a, a story that you can watch, you know, easily and enjoy, uh, like any movie, and in the process learn something that you didn't know before about American history, and that is the impact that cooperatives have had. So if somebody out there wanted to have a screening, how would they get a hold to you? They should go uh, right to the, the website and uh, look at the trailer. And the trailer is part of a crowdfunding campaign, and then it, it has on there host a screening. There's a fee for hosting a screening. We try to make it as reasonable as we can during National Co-op Month, and they can uh, click that button, and they will they will be on on the list to have a screening. We will get them a DVD and make sure they get it enough in advance, and uh, we'll put them on our map. We have a map on the website with stars of all the places where screenings are occur occurring. Uh, anybody in the D.C. area can go to the see your star and see busboys and poets and the date that your screening is going to happen and location and all that. What's your web page? Oh, the title of the film is Food for Change, and the title of the, webs uh, the website address is foodforchange.coop. 
So anybody out there, if you wanted to know where the screenings are or if you wanted to start do a screening yourself, you could go to foodforchange.coop, and you can get all that information. And you can also make donations. Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't realize how much work promotion was until I took it on. <laughs> you can. Yeah, it's 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 a huge task. But it, as a result of doing this prom- promotion, a lot of good things have happened. You know, the film would not go nearly as far in the world if I didn't decide to be the one who was going to wake up every morning thinking, how am I going to get this film into front of more people and get the co-op story told and understood, you know, that that takes time and resources. And I've got um, three other people working with me on this. And it's, uh, you know, we're highly motivated and we could use support (laughs) from anybody out there that's inclined to give it. Well, I am going to personally donate five hundred dollars. I was looking at trying to do that. Whoa! The show. <laughs> you no. just made my morning. Well, yeah. In know, fact, you made my day, and I think my weekend. <laughs> and I'll say this to everybody out there: I, I used to not say when I would donate, but a preacher said to uh, one time I heard a sermon saying that you you tell people what you do so you give you have a chance to say how good God has been in your life, and He's been extremely wow. good to me. So Thank you so much. I've, I've sold two properties this year, and i got to tell you, in the D.C. area, and I didn't have them on the market. People came to me. Mm. Um, so made a little few dollars. So I'm going to go online, hopefully, before I leave the studio today. So I, I'll remember. That's my problem is remembering to do things. But <laughs> I'll get this done. Uh, we only have an, about a minute and a half to go, Steve. So mm-hmm. what would you like to leave people with? Oh, I just hope they see my movie. You know, I I, I make movies because I like them and I want them to be fun and enjoyable. And uh, I like good, strong storyline, good narrative. I like humor in a movie. I like to feel when I see a film, particularly documentary, that, you know, I I, I have a reaction like, wow, I didn't know that. That's really different. That's really interesting. I didn't know that happened. And, uh, you know, and you see things and... You know, I just feel that it, when you capture somebody's attention at the beginning of a movie and then you take them on this ride, in this case for 82 minutes, and it's over, and after it's over, they've gone through something, you know? They've Lovely. gone through an experience. That's my job. You know, yeah. that's what I try to do, whatever movie I make. And I pulled out all the stops, and I tried to do it on this one, and I, I hope people get to see it. Well, I saw it, and I loved it. I learned something from it, too, so... Thank you. Thank you very much for what you do. Thank you. And everybody out there, please have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll be back next Thursday and live cooperatively. Uh, What Steve has said to you, that's what's in our genes. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Bye now. 1450 WOL.